please watch the video screen. Who do you say Jesus was? I have no idea. Who was Jesus? Gosh, I have to start with, I'm not sure. Who was Jesus to you? Some guy. Actually, I don't believe in Jesus. I'm not really sure exactly who Jesus was. I think Jesus was, uh, was a was kind of a cool guy back in his day. Who was Jesus to you? <laughs> I think I'm not, I don't like to talk about it. I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. Who do you think Jesus was, or is? Uh, Jesus was a historical figure. I believe that Jesus Christ was a man who had an extraordinary ability to link in with the Creator. I think he was uh, definitely some of that people you know, a good role model. I, I do think he had a lot of great ideas. More or less, he was just a prophet, which is just a messenger of God. Sort of a revolutionary in his day. Jesus was an amazing man. I don't believe he's God's son. I just believe he's a person. As to his, like, God-like quality, I'm not totally sold on that. You think he was a prophet? I thought he yeah, doesn't be Christian really well, but Jesus was the Messiah for some people, and for some people he wasn't. I'm not necessarily sure if Jesus was the Messiah or a prophet, but in either case, he was somebody that spoke the word of God. He was equal portions of, of human and uh, an identity that is God. People said he was sent by God. Well, no one, God doesn't send him down, you know, go on up. I mean, you know, he linked it. I mean, I do believe in Jesus in the sense of, like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. That I'm not saying that he didn't exist or anything of the sort, but the fact that, um, I mean, I necessarily don't go and uh, pray to Jesus. Who was Jesus? Uh, he's the Son of God. Jesus was the Son of God. I believe Jesus is the Son of God who came to save us all from our sins. Jesus was the Savior. Who died for our sins and cleaned us, made us pure enough to enter God's glory. The, um, only way you can get to him, who do you think Jesus is? Um, who do I think he is? I, I don't think it's who he was. I think he still is Jesus, so it's not gone or anything, you know. I guess embodied technically he is, but he's still here. The Jesus stories were the borders on history and myth for me. Um, but I don't believe that it could have permeated our culture so fully and for so long if there was nothing to that. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. He was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. He came in human form, but he really wasn't like us. He came from a far, far away place. The only son of his father, and his father sent him here to be on a mission. He blended in, but he wasn't like anyone else. He had extraordinary power, unlike anything anyone had ever, ever seen before, and he was, in every way possible, a savior. So who am I talking about? Not Jesus. Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leave tall buildings in a single bound. Disguised as mild-mannered, Clark Kent, but able to be transformed by way of a phone booth into the Man of Steel. In the most recent movie, Superman, Man of Steel, which came out just a few months ago, there was a really strong connection between Superman and Jesus. In one scene, there is a, a spirit form of the father of Superman, Jor-El. And he comes alongside of, of Superman, and they're standing in a place where they can see the whole world. And Jor-El says to Superman, he says, you can save her. You can save everyone. And then Superman flies off into space, but as he does, 
He doesn't do the typical arms out in front kind of move of flying. He does so with his arms stretched out to the side in the perfect form of a cross. <coughs> Why? Because he can save Lois Lane and he can save you too. We love our superheroes, don't we? Have you noticed all of the superhero movies that are on the screen these days? All those people that we read about in the comic books years ago, well now you can watch them on the big screen coming this summer or if already, X-Men and Guardians of the Galaxy and Transformers and Hercules and Captain America and Spider-Man and Godzilla. Godzilla is a hero if you haven't seen the movie yet. And coming pretty soon in the future, uh, not too distant future, Superman versus Batman. Bruce Wayne doesn't stand a chance. So who was your superhero growing up? The connection between Superman and Jesus is something that actually becomes quite strong in the theological world. Would you be surprised that there are scholarly articles written in theological journals that would equate Jesus as the first century Superman, or Superman today as the Jesus figure from years and years ago. It makes sense, doesn't it? We want a hero. Our world is in a mess. Things are falling apart. Every day you hear about evil having its way in our world someplace. And we know that we don't have the power to fix things. And God knows that our political system is not prepared to make it all better. So we need a hero beyond ourselves. Somebody possessed with divine powers in order to fix all of the broken things. We need a superhero. So when Jesus asks his disciples, who people say that he is, I want you to notice where they're located. They're in Caesarea Philippi. Why is that significant? Because Caesarea Philippi was the summer cottage home of Herod. It wasn't really a cottage. It was a palatial mansion. And it was built on a hill that overlooked the town. And everybody, wherever you went, would see that palace and they would know that Herod is king. He's in charge. And we are not in charge. But then I want you to notice the answer that Jesus' disciples give Jesus when he asks them, who do people say that I am? They answer, well, some say John the Baptist. And others say Elijah. And others say one of the prophets. Okay, what's the common theme between those three identities? They're all dead. They're all dead. And so if Jesus is indeed one of those three, then he's going to have to be a superhero to come back from the dead. And then Jesus asks, okay, but who do you say that I am? The Gospel writer Mark places this question right smack dab in the middle of the Gospel. It's like he has been working eight chapters to get to this point where Jesus is going to ask this most important question. And it's a question that is not only asked of the disciples, it's asked of every reader, it's asked of you. Who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up to the plate and he says, well, you are Superman, the son of Jor-El. Well, he doesn't really say that. But that's exactly what he meant when he said, well, you're the Messiah. You're the Messiah. That word, Messiah, is a loaded word in Hebrew, Meshach. But it's a word that means the anointed one. In the New Testament, the New Testament was written in, in Greek. And in Greek, the word is Christos, or Christ. So when we name Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ, we're not saying Christ is his last name. No, we're, we're saying that that's his identifier name. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And Peter, 
along with all the other disciples and all the other ordinary folk are standing there. They are looking for a hero because life is not easy. This land that God gave the Israelites, it's not theirs anymore. They look around, they see the Roman soldiers, they know they're not in charge of their own property. It now all belongs to Caesar and their tax. Beyond belief, they are taxed. 80% tax rate. That was pretty low. 90% tax rate. Get this. 110% tax rate. You, you could never get ahead. And, and the temple, that place where God is supposed to live, it doesn't belong to the Jews anymore. It's not Herod's temple. He built it. He put the high chief priest in charge of the temple. And all of the temple tax goes to him. Life was horrible. And Peter remembers reading passages in the Bible about the promise of, a, of an anointed one, a, a Messiah, a king that would be coming someday to make everything better. And this king would come with power and with authority. And Peter has been watching Jesus long enough to know that he has power. He has done amazing things. And he's listened to the sermons that Jesus has preached. And he knows that he speaks as one with great authority. And so everybody looks to Jesus and they say, maybe he is the Messiah. Of course he was. Of course he was the Messiah, but not in the way that Peter expected, and not in the way that anybody would have expected. But he was the Messiah in every way that was needed. Now, when I was growing up, I didn't watch all the Superman stories. I wasn't a huge Superman fan, but my guy was the Lone Ranger. You knew the Lone Ranger was a good guy because he always wore a white hat. Wherever he went, and the stories of the Lone Ranger were so exciting for a little kid because, you see, the Lone Ranger always stood for good things, right? He was always trying to beat the bad guys or save the women or get the money back from the, the robbers who stole from the bank and now all the town is depleted and everyone is, you know the stories. And there's always a point in all of the Lone Ranger stories where the Lone Ranger gets in trouble. He uh, either gets tied up or he gets zonked on the head or... Or maybe, um, you know, they've got a gun to his head. It always looked bad, but then turned good. And you knew it was going to turn good when the William Tell Overture played. <laughs> and you knew at that moment that the Lone Ranger was going to win the day. And he's going to get the girl, he's going to win back the money, he's going to put away the bad guys for good. Wouldn't it be cool if Jesus mounted a white stallion? And the William Tell Overture started to play. And he rode into Caesarea Philippi, or to Jerusalem, or better yet, to Rome. And he whipped out Herod. And he kicked out Caesar. And he did away with all the bad guys. Isn't that what everyone wanted in a Messiah? And Jesus tells Peter, you answered right. I am the Messiah. Don't tell anyone. Don't say a word. Why would he say that? Because Jesus is not going to be a Messiah like a Superman. He's not going to be a superhero. And it's going to be a while before Peter and the rest of the disciples are going to figure out what this Messiah really means. They have to get to the end of the story. They have to walk with Jesus to the very end, to the point at which Jesus, in fact, <coughs> is going to give up his life. It's at that point that they're going to understand what anointed means, all the way to the cross. So it comes to this. Jesus is not your superhero who will take away all of your problems. He will not swoop in and beat down the bad guys of this world or those who are in your life. He will not beat up on Herod. He will not beat up on your enemies. If you are dangerously in debt, Jesus will not make it so that you magically win the lottery. If you have a troubled marriage, Jesus will not make it so that overnight your spouse agrees with everything you say. 
If you did not study for a test, Jesus will not magically turn your wrong answers into right answers. And if you have trials and tribulations, you will have trials and tribulations. He will not take them away. And so you might be thinking, well, what sort of Messiah is this? And that's a great question. He's the kind of Messiah that will teach you about the cross. That will teach you about the cross. And I hope that the rest of this sermon series for June and July will fill in even more specifically what that means for you. But in those words is not only the direction for life, but the power for life as well. Jesus is the kind of Messiah who will teach us about the cross. Every once in a while, you get a phone call from somebody who um, doesn't go to church, or maybe they've been kind of distant from God, and all of a sudden their life is falling apart, and, and they, they need help. One day I got a call from a woman, and she really needed help. Her son was being sent to prison. Her husband was a drunk, and she had just been notified that she had to have major surgery. So in the course of the conversation on the phone, I said, I have to ask you kind of a dumb question, I realized. But how can I pray for you? What, what specifically can I pray for in your life? And she said this, that God would fix everything. And I said, God doesn't fix everything. That's not how he works. God does a fixing work, but oftentimes in ways that we never see happening, nor do we expect it to happen. And when God, God does God's fixing work, it oftentimes is in ways that um, take for a long time. But he does come. And he does promise that because he carried upon himself the burden of the cross, that the cross that you carry is possible. He does promise that wherever you go, you go not alone. He is with you, even before you. He does promise that the powers of this world cannot compete with his powers. So that his peace, his hope, his joy may come through in the midst of the struggles of life. And he promises, someday he will make it all better forever. Now I know that's not enough for some people. They, they want a God who responds immediately exactly the way they need God to respond. And, and so they go to other churches or they listen to other pastors or they just simply walk away from God altogether. But let's be honest. It's really in the hardest of times that we face that we discover who we are and what we're made of. And what's most important, it's only in struggles that we're able to, well, whether successfully or not, work through them, that we're taught that the limits of human endeavors, the divine possibilities that exist in the midst of it all. It's only in confronting our greatest fears and in the finality of life that when we place our lives into the hands of our Heavenly Father, that we truly begin to live. My senior year of my um, seminary education, my father's cancer came back <coughs> very strongly. Towards the end of the first semester, my mom called and said, I think you need to come and spend some time with your dad. So I got on a plane in Minneapolis, flew to San Francisco, and I spent a great week with my dad, the best week I could possibly ever experience. I headed back to seminary. A couple weeks later, my mom called again and said, I think you need to come back. It's not going to be long. And I'm thinking, I'm coming to the end of my, my semester, and I've got papers to write, and this is really important. I mean, if I don't, if I don't complete these classes, I'm not going to graduate in the spring. So I got on the plane, and I was angry with God. God, why would you do this to me right now? Why would you do this to me now? And then I got to the hospital and I saw my dad and he was gasping for air and he was struggling and it was painful to watch. And then I asked God, why would you do that to him? Why would you do that to him now? God, you can fix anything. You can snap your fingers and 
and he'd be better. Heal. You've done that before. Why can't you do it now? So I was angry, and I sat down, and later that afternoon or early evening, I don't recall exactly when, a nurse came in, and um, she had a drip line, and, and she put it into my dad and hung it on the hanger, and I asked, what, what is that? She said, it's a sedative. It's going gonna, gonna to calm him down. So I sat, and, and as that was dripping into his body, and as his body stopped moving and jostling, I found my spirit also stopping the moving and the jostling. And, and, and there was a peacefulness and a sense to know it's okay. It's going to be okay. And you're not alone. My prayer is that you will discover this Jesus as a Messiah who leads you to the cross. But then in the cross and on the cross gives you a sense of life and hope and peace that sustains you forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. I invite you to rise and share the peace of Christ with those who are here.